absolutely delighted that we have as our presenter today, although it will be more uh, two-way conversation, Jyoti Balani. And I'll have to ask Jyoti to give her uh, bio. Uh, it is so extensive and I'll never be able to do it justice. But I'd like to, to state how I know Jyoti. Uh, Jyoti and I are both members of the ILO Institute, which is the Institute for Innovation in Large Organizations. And I've been affiliated with it for several years uh, as a client. Now I'm a member and I'm also a fellow in it. And Jyoti runs the Artificial Intelligence Group, and we are able to interact with uh, innovation teams from some of the most famous organizations you see in the news and exchange interesting ideas about innovation. And um, I do want to uh, remind everyone our webinar is being recorded. And um, I'm going to ask Jyoti, I can say that Jyoti is an absolute expert in artificial intelligence, conversational artificial intelligence. Uh, Jyoti uh, regularly speaks literally all over the world uh, on artificial intelligence. And I will have to ask Jyoti, please give your bio. And I encourage everyone to, to go to her LinkedIn profile and take a look because it is extensive and uh, I will never be able to give all the details. Uh, Jyoti, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, first of all, for the opportunity to be here, uh, John, and thank you for the kind introduction. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm founder and managing director of FreshRiver.ai. So we're a, a conversational AI and data science consultancy. We do strategy and delivery work for the Fortune 100, and now it's expanding to Fortune 500. And in fact, startups across the other domains in uh, Web3, uh, quantum computing, um, blockchain are all coming to us as well, saying, hey, AI is intersecting all our spaces. Uh, what the heck is going on? So well, we're also helping and advising some advisory for two Web3 startups as well. Um, so I started focusing on this area about five years ago. Prior to that, I was in the corporate world myself for about 22 years. Uh, so I grew up as a software engineer, all in the telecom space, wireless, wireline. I worked for Texas Instruments, AT&T, Lucent Technologies, if everybody remembers them. Um, and then on to uh, mid-sized, uh, mid-market companies. So I also built products and services. Um, and then did marketing for a couple of years. So, you know, I've sort of pivoted functionally, um, but I got out of the telecom space about five years ago to see what else was rising and uh, was lucky enough timing wise to fall into conversational AI. Um, you know, I think of the world in three dimensions, largely around what problems it can solve. I do believe that uh, AI is a a tool that we need to master. Uh, it's not a hammer looking for a nail, which is largely what's going on right now. Um, I am a big believer in human first capitalism and activism. Uh, you know, I'm a capitalist, yes, but it can't be at the cost of, um, you know, the human condition or leaving people behind, which is what uh, AI is proposing to do. So uh, I have a fantastic team. I started out as a, a team of one uh, five years ago. Uh, I'm happy to report we've been expanding and growing um, steadily. And now it's sort of taken off in a big way uh, because of thanks to open AI largely. Now everybody knows what conversational AI is, including my mom who's been wondering what I've been doing for the last five years. So yeah. it helped, it helped. So hopefully uh, you know, that gives some backdrop on where, uh, where I'm coming at. Jyoti, I'd like to ask, um, because I think it's actually relevant to this group, uh, you play a very important role in robotics and automation. If you could talk about the org, you're in a global organization for robotics and automation, which will, uh, one of the aspects of both conversational AI that boards will need to consider uh, and general AI, AGI, uh, will be indeed be the intersection of robotics with automation and intelligent automation. Can you talk a little about your role? Sure. Um, so as you can imagine, this, is, this has been an emerging field, right? AI coming out of the hype cycle, because everybody knows, right? AI, you know, it started being coined in what, 1950? It's gone through its cycles of, you know, being in the winters and coming out. And now, of course, with, uh, the, the cheap uh, compute and uh, space and power that we've got, it's really taken off. So as part of that, there's also been rise of organizations solving problems, for example, to get more women and get more diversity into different spaces. Um, I was approached by this uh, group called the G100, uh, which started out as, with the mission of getting a million women across all domains um, into society. They're actually working with 
uh, the G20, of which India has presidency for the next one year. Uh, they also present at, you know, at the um, uh, the Parisian and the UN uh, um, pretty often. So I was approached to head the be the U.S. country chair for robotics and automation uh, to really uh, help drive um, getting more people into this space. So I'm affiliated with the G100. I am actually I've got four, three professors in the uh, in North America on our advisory board, uh, two in computer science, um, one in linguistics, uh, because we do need the arts uh, and social sciences and linguistics at the table. Uh, and I've gotten um, two very senior executives from industry uh, that are also joining us to help guide how do you get more responsible human beings handling AI. Uh, so that's a very exciting time um, that we're getting. So we're gonna be very intentional about training folks uh, to give you an idea of the demand that's coming. So the World Economic Forum in 2020 put out their labor report, which they revised last year, uh, given COVID has dramatically uh, helped uh, you know, automation and AI take off for several reasons. Uh, by 2025, there will be 95 million new jobs uh, where humans, algorithms, and machines collaborate, and 85 million jobs will be eliminated. Uh, so if we think about that, and I believe those numbers, because for the last five years, we've been actually driving the work uh, that is causing all that to happen. Uh, there is a big gap in talent. Uh, the education system is not producing enough talent for these spaces. So part of my role at G100, my mission, is how do we educate more people to get in in a, in a very action-oriented way? Um, I actually incubated a program at Fresh River called the FAM, uh, Fresh River Apprenticeship and Mentorship in 2020, when I was getting so many projects uh, coming in, I could not handle it. And I said, could I train people in my framework and methods and mentor them to build products that are AI powered? And in six months, 10 people, five grad school interns and five women were able to build a proof of concept for me building a conversational AI product, which was remarkable. So we have a way of training. I think our old education systems are broken. Um, recruiting systems for sure are broken. There are new jobs being created, uh, which we're gonna need uh, for this world where human machines and algorithms will collaborate. And the mass impact to existing jobs is coming and it's gonna all happen in a very compressed time frame. Uh, as you can imagine, 2025 is right around the corner for us, right? So. Uh, I'm also part of the Open Voice uh, Network. It is a Linux foundation uh, where I'm an industry advisor to shape uh, user trust, privacy. There's new frameworks that are needed. And John, you and I have talked about, you know, how the regulatory framework, uh, security frameworks, we are very behind in having these frameworks catch up to where AI is. So that's really the gap that I'm hoping to, you know, uh, partner up with John and many other leaders in the space to fill. So I'd like to go to the heart of our topic today, uh, and that is, of course, what do governance boards need to know about AI? Uh, conversational AI is a very good topic, obviously, because it's getting so much publicity. And um, we have to remember, of course, that a governance board, uh, board members have fiduciary duties. There are different articulations of those, uh, the ones I'm familiar with from statutes are duty of loyalty and duty of care. And I have focused on duty of care with my compliance and legal background. But of course, um, you'll see sometimes a third, which is duty of obedience. And then the other type of boards uh, that are rising in popularity uh, um, for many reasons is of course the advisory board. And uh, I certainly believe that more than ever, uh, it is imperative that boards address the issue. And Jyoti, you've worked with a lot of senior executives and boards. And um, I think one of the challenges boards have is what we call the Dunning-Kruger effect. The less you know about something, the more confident you are that you know enough about it to make a decision. And I think a lot of boards are in that situation, uh, not only with cybersecurity, not only with fiduciary duty knowledge, but certainly artificial intelligence. And so the question I have uh, is that I want to address, and we have absolutely outstanding talent in this uh, in this meeting today, um, that uh, I'd like to ask you, Jyoti, what, what's the minimum level of knowledge that board members need? And I'll maybe I should say a board needs because 
I, I do believe there's some level of knowledge every single board member needs about AI to function, to rise above the Dunning-Kruger effect and have humility about the knowledge. But uh, I believe, and based on my compliance and legal background, someone on that board needs to be devoted to it. And uh, should it come through the governance board, the advisory board, should there be a committee? What's the minimum level of knowledge? And, and I would like to note, and I promise this is my only nerd moment in compliance, but I follow it up. When, whenever a topic that, is, uh, that, that invokes a lot of risk, if that topic or that technology is uh, uh, key or crucial to the business, in other words, and it, it's an existential matter to the business. And I've actually written about this under Delaware law and, and, the, and the laws of many jurisdictions, the board actually has a heightened level of duty under what's called their caremark duties to, um, to pay attention to the effect of that technology or that event uh, which is existential, but and they have to balance the short-term and long-term interest of the organization. And um, how do we rise above the Dunning-Kruger effect? Uh, and and how do we know when a board has enough information, uh, knowledge about AI, and they're not going to be technology experts? How do we address that? And I'm curious what your thoughts are. And I know there are people in this call, every single person in this call has knowledge to that we could discuss about it. And I hope we do. So Jyoti, what do you think? So actually, I want to first lay a, a historical foundation for everybody. Yes. Um, because, you know, the media has not done us any favors that's um, yeah. with the frenzy that's coming at everybody, right? Um, there's the, the optimists and the pessimists, and there's people, you know, we're talking about all the AI related movies coming out. So let's first pause for a moment and think about where we came from, right? And this is the lens that I put it in. So think about the fact that 25 years ago, the web was born, right? We went through the cycle of web interfaces, and this is around the human machine interaction. Yes. We then went into the mobile age where the, the form factor was right here. But in both those eras, we humans had to learn how to use the machine, yeah? Mm -hmm. We are now in the third wave of human to machine interaction where the machines understand us or yeah. appear to, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And that's a game changer and it's a paradigm shift because you've now removed the friction that has always been there between human and machines. So if you think about what that means is now a machine can understand what I'm saying. So if you think about chat GPT, you ask it a question or a similar uh, uh, conversational AI platform, large language model that's coming out on the market literally daily. Um, I think I can ask it anything, but it has no guardrails. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so what you're seeing the search wars is that's currently what's going on, right? There's a war on how do you do search for human knowledge, okay? So that's literally where we're at. That's the frame of reference. Now you take that frame of reference and look at any company on the planet or any organization or government that currently uses web interfaces and mobile interfaces. And every one of these organizations and institutions have workflows between humans, between humans and applications, between applications and applications. Mm -hmm. That is in a very simplified way and data. How could I forget mm -hmm. the, the lifeblood that goes literally like blood through every organization to keep it functioning? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here comes a new way of humans to machine, human to machine interaction. And also in the spectrum of AI, it begins with the lowest level of automation called robotic process automation, okay, RPA. It's been around for some time. And in very simple terms, it's how two applications can mm -hmm. talk to each other without needing a human in between, okay? Mm -hmm. Now you go up the scale in the center where you have all these workflows that you know keep an organization alive. Those can be automated mm -hmm. and orchestrated with AI. And on the far end is this cognitive intelligent automation 
which mm -hmm. is the conversational AI piece that we're talking about, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's the spectrum. These are all tools. So I always say, I look at technology, not as a hammer looking for a tool. It's first making sure we understand the problems we wanna solve and how we wanna solve them comes after mm -hmm. the tooling. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a mindset shift. I think we've built all these capabilities with technology, basically ramming them in. And I'm an engineer, okay? So this is not me standing back and pointing at engineers. I'm the engineer. I'm actually doing this myself. So that is the first frame of reference that we are walking board through. So we're actually being called in to the senior leadership and the boardrooms because guess what? All the stakeholders are impacted by this. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. cutting across every function, every industry, every vertical. Mm -hmm. Nobody's immune. If somebody says, oh, it doesn't impact us, they are very wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing we also get is say, okay, for every stakeholder in the room, what is your duty? So you talk about the, the board, it's fiduciary duties, right? The mm -hmm. framework that was given uh, has worked to a degree uh, based on how we've come along over the last you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? As a human civilization. How do you take something that, the AI automation areas that I talked about and even get a handle on what that means to the organization when daily it's shifting everything in the enterprise of how it works. Mm -hmm. How will the board get the reports that they get, for example, right? Uh, tell us where risk is across the board, you know, financial, technical, uh, auditing, right? But they cannot with their current frameworks get a handle on what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys saw the news today. There's an open letter to pause for all AI labs to pause on training beyond GPT-4. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, you know, I signed it too because I'm like, guys, we're deploying this for these large organizations and the frameworks are not cut off. We talked to security, heads of security. They have no idea what vulnerabilities AI will produce. They need time to think about it, but the business is pushing because you are a capitalistic society, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I'm a capitalist too, but if our frameworks cannot catch up to that, how will the boards have the ability to get a readout on what's going on in the enterprise, even advisory? Mm -hmm. So there's this thing called the exponential gap. It's the difference between how quickly technological change is pushing and the human ability to catch up. But because AI is moving so fast, we're right here and this gap is getting bigger and bigger. So this exponential gap is what we've got to figure out how to get our arms around. Mm -hmm. Can AI be stopped? Honestly, I don't think so. The Pandora, you know, it's out of, out of the box, right? We went from a million users in five days mm -hmm. to 10 million in 55 days for chat TPT. And it's, it's going to keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge for the boards are going to uh, try to figure out how should the framework shift? And they cannot completely overhaul the entire framework. I would say, what are the three most critical? Usually three is a good number, right? Because human brains can only talk about three things at one time, usually. What do you put into place to make sure the bleeding stops? So I'll give you an example of banks. A lot of the, the clients we're working with at banks, they're saying, all our employees are bringing chat GPT in. Yes. They're experimenting. So that forced the banks to actually say, wait, hang on. They either ban it on one end or they say they work with OpenAI, you know, Anthropic, all these other guys who are these, these emerging platforms, bringing it in, trying to make safe zones. Now imagine the conversation they're having with their boards. Well, I'd like to give a, an example. I've actually worked in machine learning projects uh, in even back in the 1990s in I'll call the professional decision support industry. So for lawyers, accountants, that's my background and physicians and nurses most recently. So I've been tracking AI and I would say the machine learning I've worked with approached artificial intelligence levels. And what I saw uh, in the organization is the CFO would say, I need to cut the editorial headcount, uh, so the the lawyers or the physicians who are curating professional knowledge, I need to cut 50 or 100 headcount. 
And uh, I can use the machine learning algorithm to curate the knowledge to the point at a lower quality standard. Uh, and I can achieve my cost goals and I'll uh, keep uh, a smaller portion of the human uh, expertise and their workflow will change and my cost is redu reduced and the market will accept the lower quality. And I actually did witness this. I saw this happen. I saw a, um, a 200 year old product that had print origins in the late, uh, late 19th century uh, obliterated in just about five years uh, through machine learning by by the competition. And the market, the lawyers knew it was producing lower quality and they were happy with it. They were fine with it. It was not a problem. That lesson stands out in my mind. And as I'm reading about AI and clinical uh, decision support, um, uh, the internet of things being embedded, um, I'm wondering if the board... So to me, I would want to say to the board, um, you know, you need to pay attention to these to this financial temptation to quickly change uh, the cost structure, uh, balancing it with quality. Uh, and uh, and just because the market might accept it, it doesn't mean it's right. So I don't know. I'm introducing a lot of difficult issues. And by the way, if you anyone has opinions, because, James, I know that you have a lot of startup uh, history. You are on the boards of many startups. And I know that uh, you've faced decisions like this. If you have any input, please unmute and just talk. We'd love to get all your wonderful talent and insights. I've attended your webinar and I uh, fr uh, and loved it. So um, I'm just curious, Joe T, how would you, if you're on the board and you are, you have stock options as part of your compensation, and you will, uh, you're in a publicly held company and you're going to financially benefit by that cost reduction. And you're going to be retiring from the board in one to two years. You're out of there. Uh, why, why should you pay attention? What, what does it matter? So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. I'm just trying to be very practical in my yep. questions. Yeah. So hopefully there's a good blend on the board of people who will see the short and long game office um you know ideally i'm sure there's it might be lopsided so if you've got more that are if i were you know in a short run and i'm a capitalist by nature first yes um i would say go for it uh but i think there should be some caution mm -hmm. and i'll tell you why uh why you should not just open up the tap of hey guys go run as fast as you can um ai has the ability to be destructive. Mm -hmm. Initially, it will look like it is doing amazing work. And I'm saying this from a practitioner standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Uh, everybody probably saw what happened when uh, uh, Kevin Roos, the journalist, this is in the the New York Times front page, right? He mm -hmm. was having a conversation with ChatGPT. Yes. Um, or was it Bart? I think it was one of those two. Yes. And it started out good enough until it started to end up where it told him to divorce his wife. Yes. Okay? That's a small example. Imagine uh, enterprises deploying something like that for their consumers and clients mm -hmm. with no human oversight. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a bomb waiting to go off relative to lawsuits because mm -hmm. um, there's no, no oversight, right? And how do you explain what happened? You cannot explain large language models. Okay. Mm -hmm. The creators of these models don't know how they work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. this is the danger. So you go all the way back to the, you know, sitting in the seat of a board member uh, who should know this. So this is where back to your question on what should they know? These are the kinds of things they should know on the spectrum of the art of the possible, the most amazing things we can do with it, which mm -hmm. I'm very excited about, but on the other end, how wrong it could go and what's the price and the risk of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. here's a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not mean to interrupt. So here's a question. So let's just say all of us. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine people in this meeting. Let's just pretend that we're on a nine person board. That would be a big board, but let's pretend we're on a board. All of us 
have different levels of, of AI knowledge. Jyoti, you probably have the most AI knowledge of all of us. And you are saying, hey, uh, we need to exercise caution. And the rest of us are saying, well, you know, uh, everyone everyone in my market is rushing to do AI. My, my investors are asking me, let's say you're Apple and Apple is getting criticism right now. Oh, Apple's very behind in AI. Uh, Amazon is behind an AI. Of course, I don't believe that, but that's the mark. That is the shareholder message that we're hearing, uh, and we're under great pressure uh, as a board to put pressure on the CEO to get moving on AI. What would you advise us to do, Jyoti? You you have all this insight, and we're we're probably resistant. Maybe we have the Dunning Kruger effect in the sense that we're all hyper successful people. Uh, we have a, a long history of successes and we've overcome a lot of problems in business. Why should we be cautious now? We'll just treat it like any other cybersecurity, the year 2000 debacle. It's just all like the same crises from the past. I can just treat it the same. We'll get through it. We'll be okay. What would you advise us if you're on our board? So I would have said, go Google this, but you know, the example I'm about to give is that yeah. why didn't you go Bing it? Yes. What happened when Google released Bard? Yes. How much market value got wiped out That's nearly right. instantaneously? Yes, yes. Uh, that are you about to sell your shares today? Yes, <laughs> yes. This is how yes. fast. It's not going to take years. We're literally in, we're talking weeks or days when you're releasing something out to the market and it goes wrong. Yes. Your market value is getting wiped out. It's very yes. simple. You yes. know, that's how I speak to folks that would say, hey, why why can we not just go for it, right? It's not cloud. Cloud took 10 years mm -hmm. to get to the stage of the cloud adoption. We had time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. go take risk. It's not going to. So, you know, and I think the problem is to get people's head wrapped around time of impact. You know, mm -hmm. when you when you think about uh, when we're launching a missile, right? People are going, "What's the 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 the, the uh, countdown to impact? Countdown to impact is near instantaneous in terms of what it means to market value. So the shares are not going to be as valuable. You know, you might actually see a wipeout. Mm -hmm. Not to be dramatic, mm -hmm. but if you just look at what happened from that simple thing, simple thing of when they had the demo go wrong, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. said that's crap. Let's put that in the shoes of, you know, Fortune Company X. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They release something and it fails and it fails really spectacularly. The media is all over it. What do you think is going to happen? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the risk. So here's a here's an interesting thing. So, of course, I'm 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 being deliberately provocative in my questions. But, uh, for example, let's say that I we're a manufacturing company and I can say, well, you know, Jyoti, we're not a search engine. We're not like Google. So that really doesn't apply to us. And um, I can start deploying chatbots for customer service and I can eliminate a lot of people. I can get rid of a lot. Uh, I can get rid of a lot of, uh, of call overhead. And um, uh, so Jyoti, what, where do I go to get a basic primer on conversational AI and generative AI? for board members, you know, uh, how do I, where do I get my certification? Do I take a LinkedIn learning class or what do I do? <laughs> I mean, I, and I know it sounds crazy, but I, I know board members, I know board members who would think this way and mm -hmm. they would think, well, if I read an article in the wall street journal or the FT, I know all I need to know are barons. And I know all I need to know to make my decision. Um, my peers are reading it and I on the golf course, I learned uh, the most important risks about AI on the golf course, and um, I'll make I've I've made decisions like this in the past. And um, how how Jyoti do we say? Oh, okay. Well, I can tell you how you know how I think about it. I I want to talk about the legal and regulatory risks, but when I say that to board members, I get a lot of pushback. Actually. Uh, you know, oh, well, the business judgment will, rule will protect me, so I, I really don't have to worry about it. So I'm just curious, Jyoti, do, how would you, you know, what do you recommend that people go learn to, and and what 
what is the minimum level of knowledge and and what how do I keep up if I'm a board member I'm not going to learn algorithms I'm not going to learn python I'm not going to learn how to code uh, but I need to understand something about large large language models and AI in order to make a competent decision so that if I am sued in a, um, in a publicly held company, a shareholder derivative suit um, or a breach of fiduciary duty or whatever, um, I'm able to get the protection of the business judgment rule. That would be how I would think or get my stock options at least be able to sell my stock. Well, see, this goes back to the exponential gap that I talked about, yes, right? Yes, yes. The ability for the human brain to get their head wrapped around the impact of this yes. uh, is unprecedented. So uh, the billions and billions of parameters that we use, that are used to train these large language models, the mm -hmm. amount of content that was consumed for mm -hmm. GPT-3 and now GPT-4, mm -hmm. it would take, I think that they said the stat, it would take a human 100 million years to read all of that. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's think about that for a minute. Yes. Uh, it's not possible to go figure out this impact of AI because it's constantly changing. We're in completely unchartered waters. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when a board member is getting their little slice of information on the golf course mm -hmm. or with their poker buddies or when they open up the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, it's literally a drop in the ocean mm -hmm. of understanding what is this. Mm hmm. That's point number one. Point number two, there is no course on this planet that can be taken to learn what the heck's going on because it's changing literally daily, if not hourly. Yes. By the time you go learn about, oh, this is what's happening, it's already moved ahead. Mm -hmm. We've got this problem with our four-year instit university institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got this problem with any kind of online learning, you know, LinkedIn or you know, the MOOC, the MOOCs, right? Uh, so you cannot go to get any information, which explains why I've got people coming at me at such high speed saying, can you explain to us what the heck is going on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because we're literally in the eye of the storm where mm -hmm. we're deploying it and we have to warn our clients, listen, uh, you, you know, you don't have the security framework to handle this. We are advising that you don't do this. And we paint the picture of what's happening. And luckily, there's already bad stuff happening that's out in the media. All we have to do is just point to that um, shareholder value wipeout. I mean, market value wipeout. Yeah, I think the Google example is absolutely <clears throat> compelling. But what a lot of people don't realize, and I find it fascinating how little the media has covered it. There are probably around, I'm going to estimate, 75 lawsuits uh, in the U.S., particularly against state government and state agencies, where AI algorithms have uh, failed to um, provide the correct unemployment benefits, disability benefits. Right. Uh, there are several instances where AI has led to the wrongful arrest of people. Yeah. Uh, in the Netherlands, there was a huge crisis in, in I believe it was child welfare services uh, or some other government services. So actually, uh, in India, there are several examples of huge mistakes in algorithms, but it's not very well known. And uh, so so the risks are there. But for some reason, those stories are not going into the New York Times or the Wall Street Journals or Barron's or Fortune or Forbes and uh, not, not reaching that intended audience, which I find interesting. Now, you, you mentioned something I think very important that connects to a webinar uh, one of the Bonner Institute Associates, Major General David Fraser, uh, talked about, and that is that things are moving so fast that you have to become a, an anticipant organization. And I'm curious, and, and you encounter this in Fresh River AI, how do you inculcate the leadership traits that uh, can handle this rate of change in AI. So there's there's never a point in time when we can get enough knowledge, although we need some level of knowledge to be able to acknowledge the problem. But what are the leadership traits that we need to recruit for in board members? And if you're a board, what leadership traits and other qualities 
do you need to recruit in your CEO and evaluate your CEO performance on? Uh, how do we educate our shareholders? Uh, hey, cut us some slack when we make a decision not to move forward on an AI project because uh, the uh, it, it the project violates the the spirit of our pr corporate purpose or our uh, there's long term harm. What are the traits that that board members need and they need to evaluate the team on? In your opinion, and I know. And by the way, there's something I'd like to say about Fresh River. I think is good is that uh, Jyoti has required her employees to take training in ethics and philosophy and psychology. Uh, so I know Jyoti understands this issue very well. So Jyoti, I'm curious what you think. Yeah, so actually I want to just uh, respond to the thing you talked about where the failures have taken place. There's actually a database called the AI Hall of Shame. AI Hall of Shame. I think it's Wired Magazine, isn't Wired it? Wired Magazine, yes. yeah. Yes. Um, and the fact that it's what not it covered yeah. by... Uh, other media outlets just speaks to yes. the uh, the dog in the that they have in the fight politically. Yes, uh, this is it's just exposing all of that, right? So yeah. that's where you can't possibly read all the media magazines in the world. Yes, um, but you got to go trust. This is now where the question comes in on who do you trust to tell you uh, where the deployments are. So I, I highly recommend you know bookmark that one. It's got governments in it. It's got big tech in it. It's yes. got a lot of people. So, you know, we tell our clients, I said, our number one goal is to keep you out of that database. Yes. Okay. So that's how our, our number one goal. I put a link in the chat feature for everyone. So you can, uh, can access it, by the way, the Wired Magazine article. So now going to the question around, you know, the leaders that are making these decisions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my view, and we have this in our framework because I have it for my team as well, right? They're going to have to have a balance of economic, ethical, and emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Because every decision you're making can't be just driven by economics. You know, mm -hmm. driving down the cost or, you know, mm -hmm. revenue, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, cut out humans. You know, the layoffs that we've seen? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. no coincidence that the number of people being laid off unprecedented at these big companies, mm -hmm. right? Amazon did 9,000, Google and they're saying, well, we all overhired at the same time. I said, um, no, because you have deployed automation already. None of these people are going to find the same jobs again. That okay, is so true. That is keep true. that in mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so coming back to you know emotional, ethical, and economic intelligence. So let's think about this. Going back to human to machine interactions, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Machines have to understand humans. In mm -hmm. order for machines to understand humans, Mm -hmm. The humans that are training these machines and developing services around it, they themselves have to be responsible, which means they have to have economic, ethical, and emotional intelligence, which is why anybody who comes into Fresh River has to take a course on the latest uh, introduction to philosophy, introduction to psychology. Uh, we actually use a outfit called outlier.org that has the best professors in the world that are, are, are teaching this. Um, it's actually by the co-founder of masterclass.com. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I said, anybody who's going to handle AI at our company needs to first understand the best research we have on human ethics, human psychology and philosophy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you can only take that into account when you are designing, for example, conversational AI. Like I'm going to take it down to like the, the, the bottommost level. OK, so we have a, a role called conversation designer, which, you know, comes uh, which was formed only three years ago. That mm -hmm. role didn't even exist three years ago. Mm -hmm. And these folks are folks that have background in psychology, in social sciences, artists. They're the ones who will worry about how should a human and machine actually converse. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's mm -hmm. part one. Then you've got all these platforms, right, like ChatGPT. By the way, there are thousands and thousands of these platforms. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the challenge is going to be, how do you select the right technology to bring to life these, these conversations, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the leaders who are making decisions, who we work with every day, as they make their choices and they ask us, what do you think on which technology we should deploy? We, of course, start with the fact that, A, it should not be a black box. Because if we cannot, it, uh, you know, it's not deterministic. A is not deterministic. But at least we have an understanding of whether there are guardrails around it. Mm -hmm. A lot of these platforms don't. You know, ironically, OpenAI is a closed system. Mm -hmm. 
right? So uh, when we speak to these decision makers, they have pressure that comes from the top to meet short-term goals. Back to looking at, you know, uh, how do you deliver on revenue? How do you get more customers in, right? And so we say, okay, uh, we know you want to push and all we can do is advise you. Uh, and that's the, the best we can do. So if you think about how these leaders are hired, I think they should be measured on their emotional, ethical, and economic intelligence. I think there's a big push. I think there was a report on the kind of CEOs that are being hired to be more emotionally intelligent. I think the EQ level, there's there's been a big push around that. Um, That's what we right? at the Bonner Institute for Purposeful Leadership do. We develop uh, curriculum, training, and advisement about the development of the traits of purposeful leadership and emotional intelligence. And I would actually like to ask, and I, I, Elliot, I don't know if you can unmute or not, but I would like to just announce we have a distinguished person in our in our uh, audience today, our participant, Elliot. You are distinguished, Elliot. Uh, Elliot Schreiber, who is the author of the book, The Yin and Yang of Reputation Management. And Elliot, I think that appealing to reputation and you have a much deeper interpretation of reputation than what most people have. Um, how can that be used in the sense of uh, helping boards understand the need to inculcate these traits of purposeful leadership and emotional intelligence and ethical awareness uh, to balance the other pressures that are affecting board members and the C-suite? Let me just preface by saying that any notion that reputation is about PR and marketing is not my thing. I don't believe it is. I think it's an enterprise-wide alignment uh, around uh, understanding uh, and either meeting or exceeding ex stakeholder expectations. And stakeholder expectations are- I hope that question made sense. I'm wordy yeah. sometimes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess the answer, wow. Um, well, thanks for the introduction. The so let me just preface by saying that any notion that reputation is about PR and marketing is not my thing. I don't believe it is. I think it's an enterprise-wide alignment uh, around uh, understanding uh, and either meeting or exceeding ex stakeholder expectations. And stakeholder expectations are changing rapidly. And there, I think the the presentation has been outstanding because I think it's changing so fast that people shut down. Yes. I, don't, I don't think they quite know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that kept going in through my mind is that I think we're expecting too much of boards mm -hmm. and we're the pressure needs to be on management. Mm -hmm. Where do the boards get their information about AI? If we I really buy, uh, would concern me if we start looking for board members to become experts in ESG, cyber, DEI, you name it. That's what's happening with boards is they're, mm -hmm. they're looking for expertise. And so they're siloing their boards. What board members really should be is really good decision makers. And mm -hmm. what's lacking in boards is the openness to question um, and really um, uh, ask enough questions to really get at the heart of risk. Um, there, there is no risk if there's no opportunity and all, all risk should be seen not as managing risk, but managing opportunistic risk. Mm -hmm. um, so, the question, I think, from an AI standpoint is, what is the opportunity for the company? And if the company, I mean, this sounds, I know it's going to sound ridiculous because everybody is going to have an opportunity in AI. But if the company says there's no opportunity in AI, there's no risk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they will find a risk if stakeholders say you have uh, exceeded or under exceeded our expectations, our tolerance of what you should be doing. Um, I think if I were a board member right now, uh, I would be asking the management team to get as smart as possible to continue to brief us on what's going on. Uh, 
And what I, there are two things that that I get afraid of. One is that you're going to have um, an IT department that becomes so enamored with AI that they overdo it, mm -hmm. or an IT department that gets so afraid of AI with along with HR that they underdo it. And mm -hmm. I think Jody's point is it's moving so fast. How do you keep the middle ground? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think risk is going to pay, is going to come up for everyone. But right now, companies, I mean, what are they running after? They're running after the, the concerns with cyber security. We just saw with SBB, I mean, we, we don't, we've seen enough failures of people, boards not knowing how to understand risk. And that's because risk is being we're managing risk instead of the 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 risk of the strategies that we enact that doesn't answer any of the questions but i think um to the point jody was making i think we need board members to be better uh stewards of the company and that means they need to be open minded and question more than ever before and be suspicious and uh not take uh, information about what's going on, but I think boards are going to be protected from this legally. The Delaware oh, courts, no doubt about it. I mean, you can be completely incompetent, and you can get away with it. Definitely. We saw that in the McDonald's case. Oh, I, I'd like to just talk about a personal experience. So, I, in my career in a in a publicly held company, I'll just say that I did a lot of projects for the board. Uh, I did, I don't know, six projects. And I encountered situations where I had to explain, um, you know, some technologies to board members. And it was very clear they did not under, you know, did not understand what the technology was, but they also pretended that they did. And, um, and they didn't, they never would ask a question. And if I, if I tried to share knowledge or offer it, they were irritated or insulted. And then when I actually had a one-on-one -on -one meeting, they got bored. I, I kept in, there's a personality type that's attracted to boards that self-selects onto boards, I've noticed. And uh, so to me, um, I'm still of the belief there's some minimum you need to know how to read a balance sheet. And I believe that understanding some level of AI is equally as important as reading a balance sheet because the a, that fundamental understanding that enables effective decision-making uh, coupled with the uh, emotional intelligence traits and ethical sensitivity and purposeful leadership traits working together to produce optimal decision-making uh, is going to be equally as important as the uh, financial oversight. I, I believe that it's going to be so intertwined. And, um, and so based on my personal experience where I've seen people pretend to know something they clearly didn't because of, I have to say ego, I don't know what else, but they still made a funding decision they still made merger and acquisition decisions. They still evaluated the CEO. They still made uh, decisions that affected billions of dollars in revenue. So that's what concerns me. And, and yet I've seen other board members who would say, uh, well, we have a, in fact, there's a member of Congress and I don't remember the gentleman's name, but he's going back to school to get a master's in artificial intelligence. He said, I cannot be a legislator, a responsible member of Congress, and I wish I knew the gentleman's name. But he said, I have to go learn this if I'm going to be a good legislator. To Jody's point, what is he going to learn? I know. I mean, today it's he's going to learn days. something and tomorrow it's going to be it's going to be ridiculous. So let me just tell a story, John, because yeah. very quickly, because I want to I mean, I, I don't want to take up the time. Yeah. But uh, I ran a consulting firm based in Toronto that was very successful at the beginning of the wave of the internet, Web, web 1.0. Uh -huh. And we had clients that were of two types. One who said, 
tell us what this thing called the internet can do. And we help them with things like supply chain management, mm -hmm. marketing, mm -hmm. interfaces, and whatever. And then there were a lot of others that said, this is a toy for kids. When the internet had its first bubble in around 2001, all the ones that thought it was a toy for kids called us and said, we told you so. Yes. Those were companies like Westinghouse, no longer in business. Yes. yes. Um, our biggest client was General Motors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Chrysler denied the entire internet and Chrysler right. had, has continued to have problems. Yes. Not that GE has been successful. They, they've had, but Tower, they, we've had uh, Thomas Crown and a bunch of others. There are people who don't want to know what they don't want to know. Yes. And there are people who want to know everything. And hopefully we can attract more boards that are open to understanding everything. I don't expect them to become expertise, but at least be curious. And we have too many board members that are not curious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm curious in our remaining six minutes. Uh, but I'm I'm really interested in what we can I mean. James Chung has does a lot of work with uh, startups and others of what's going on in that in, in that area and with regard because you know they're looking at everything they can use to get a foothold into the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would love to ask uh, for people who are on mute. Uh, do you have any questions or comments? I love getting, I know Jyoti does. We love getting input that we can't anticipate. And we've got all this expertise in this call. So James, you unmuted. So uh, you must have something. I think the interesting dilemma is for, for early stage companies or startups, uh, there's, I don't think there's any question. Almost everyone is pivoting to try to figure out how generative AI fits in, um, just mainly because all of their clients are asking for it. Uh, um, a little bit harder for more established organizations. Like I look at the difference between that and the company that acquired my machine learning firm, mm -hmm. um, which is really struggling with that, which I suspect might be a little bit more of the case for like half the universe of the larger companies out there. I don't know exactly what that ratio is. Um, but I, I do have an interesting question, though, because I, I think we did have questions, uh, questions that uh, topics that uh, others like Elliot had raised, where you know, is it really the board's role to be the expert in generative AI when a lot of them simply aren't equipped to? Um, you know, hopefully that they have, hopefully they're making good decisions on whether the management team has the talent and the resources um uh or uh you know or 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 you know need to look at specific upgrades on that for that but in in the world of the boards that you guys are working on what percentage of of, of boards if you had to take a guess what percentage of boards of larger let's say publicly traded companies um have sort of boards and management team um focused appropriately on the impacts of generative uh, generative AI, which are no, unquestionably going to have significant impact on almost every business. But um, of the universe out there, does anyone want to hazard guesses at what they've seen so far as to how many you think have that sort of that that, that sort of dynamic, uh, you know, dialed in to to plot their course over this coming year? Uh, my my perspective and my observation so far is that. Uh, boards are interested in uh, AI and are getting 20 minute presentations on it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's, you know, they're giving the IT department, tell us about AI and what we're doing. And then they kind of say, is that sufficient? Do we need more investment in, in the area? And of course they hear yes. And they go, what's it going to cost us? And what's the competitive? But um, uh, there's not a deep dive into it. I can give you the perspective of the senior leaders we're working with that they're telling us behind closed doors, they're exactly being asked to make those presentations. And they said, we have to appear to be intelligent enough or we don't really understand what this is. <laughs> we are we're far behind. Uh, either they have experimented or they have not with chatbots, which by the way is old tech, but getting their hands around generative AI can only come when you have spent time experimenting with it in a safe way. <laughs> and they are being forced to pretend. So as much as boards, you know, you, what you talked about, John, is like they pretend like they know uh, because nobody wants to look like they're left behind. Yes. You know, where is the courage to 
to be, oh, it's okay to say you don't know. So let's give you some money to go experiment. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is the right answer because you want to know what you're dealing with. You know, I've been doing this for the last five years, you know, having moved with all the tech that's been coming in. Now this, this technology is so out of control. You know, my the top three people like I want to talk to when we enter a project is the head of security, the compliance officers, uh, and the, the, the lawyers. So I'm like, guys, let's can we do an evaluation? And tech teams hate that because it stands in the way of innovation. Mm-hmm. And so the boards, I think, need to get an even readout, not just from the technology teams, but from the business teams. By the way, businesses now, this is what senior execs on the IT side are telling us. They said our business counterparts are t- now talking to us about technology because they have access to it. Mm-hmm. I think we are in a massive shift in who knows what. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can we at least start there? and put a framework for ongoing learning, create safe spaces for experimentation, and then ask them, what do you think, right? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't, uh, you know, penalize teams that say, we don't know, because Mm -hmm. there's this culture of, we know everything, Mm -hmm. we've got a handle on it, but they possibly cannot, if if boards can understand that there's no human way possible for any team to know exactly what this is at this moment in time, Right. When did chat GPT come out? The GPT models have been coming along, right? Mm-hmm. November last year, they got released. So we're literally in the infancy of this technology mm-hmm. that's come on the scene. How do you expect anybody to mm-hmm. know that's been working with older tech as they've been coming along mm-hmm. to know what the answer is? To me, it's a commonsensical thing, right? I do want to note, we've actually reached the end of our hour. We can go a little over for anyone who wants. I, I would like to just add one remark because I, I really, of course, I, I sort of have a lawyer compliance head. That's my background uh, lens for it. But um, I do watch the evolving case law. And I think what's going to happen uh, from fiduciary duty law, which will influence board behavior, is when AI is existential to a company that when the when the core business depends on artificial intelligence, especially in the life sciences industry uh, in particular, there and Boeing, Boeing the uh, seven eighty seven Max, uh, the the case law there in Delaware is very clear that when there is special technology or a special. Pre- uh, a special project that's existential to the company, there's a heightened duty. And, uh, but the question is, when is AI existential or core to the business? Are there going to be any businesses where AI is not core? And you can say it's core to the business in terms of creating products and services and value for the customer, or you can say exclusively for internal use and cost reduction. And I, from a legal perspective, and of course I'm gonna be researching it and probably writing about it, uh, I think that's where it's going to go. That's the, the trend in Delaware, Delaware law and, uh, and the rest of the US follows that and quite frankly, a lot of the rest of the world. Jyoti, I am so delighted uh, that you spent some time with us uh, in a nice conversation. Thank you.